thank you, for, thank you guys for coming. Um, we've never done this. I just had this idea last week and asked Ken, so it kind of came together really last minute. And it's going to be probably not enough time because we have a hard stop at 3.55. The racers meeting is at 4. So I imagine in 30 or 40 minutes, people will start to trickle in. So we'll just we'll talk through it. And um, I'm going to kick us off with a few questions, and then hopefully we might, you know, if you have an urge, just raise your hand and we'll figure it out, okay? Um, and if this goes well, maybe we'll do it again next year. Uh, so I think many of you read the bios on this insanely accomplished group of people up here, these four, and I'm really excited to ask them a few questions and um, have them talk about their experiences from the trail with us. My name is Kate Coward. Um, I also do this race. <laughs> um, and I, I'm an Atois, so I've, I've done it ski, bike, run. She's also very accomplished. And, <laughs> and um, I think a few about, uh, more more up here have done the Iditarod too, so we have a lot of um, experience, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be asking the questions and they will be answering today. So why don't we just start with um, bio, whatever you might want to share with this group. They've read the details, but just introduce yourselves and then I'll kick us off with a couple of questions. Take it away. Hi, my name is Jill Martindale, and this will be my third attempt unsupported at Arrowhead this year. I have DNF'd twice before, um, but I think that DNFing um, also adds to accomplishments and uh, experiences because you're putting everything out there, you're, you're getting here, you're learning. Um, so I, I like to tell people when I've tried to do a race and when I have not finished it before because I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that um, and put it like putting in the time and training and everything like that. Um, so I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I did a rod, uh, 1,000 finisher, uh, 350 at Pursuit, Arrowhead to Scobia, um, and I love doing winter uh, riding. So that's me. Uh, I ride for Salsa in 45 North. It's your turn. Hi. My name is Peter Inman. Um, sorry for my, uh, uh, my this is my, not my, um, uh, mother language, so I was born in Czech Republic. Uh, I moved to U.S. like 20 years ago, and I've been doing a lot of uh, uh, adventures, I guess. Started from climbing, ice climbing, rock climbing, um, winter camping, skiing, and then I uh, uh, started doing like long distance bike uh, biking. Uh, races started 24 hour racing and then the few for me there was like fusion of uh, long distance riding and uh, winter camping and winter skiing was uh, uh, started with fat bikes so uh, I've been fat biking since 2012 my first race was to Scobia then Arrowhead, I've been, I think, nine or yeah, Since 20, I mean, we missed one because of COVID, but I've been coming back for since 2013. And then uh, I slowly worked my way to uh, ITI. Um, I've done it uh, four times, I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I fed pursuit to Scobia, um, and now I've, I've, I thought it was enough of biking. So this year I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to ski. <laughs> I have no idea what's gonna happen. I'm gonna just go for it. <laughs> Since we didn't have any snow, I I live um, in the Chicago suburbs, so we didn't get any snow until a few days ago. So. Um, to be honest, I didn't ski much, <laughs> so I'm just go for it and see what happens. <laughs> Here, can I crash it? <laughs> no, I'm not crashed. <laughs> so he apologized for his cute accent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Gretchen Metza. Uh, I have done Arrowhead twice. The first time it took me nearly 50 hours and I slept two times. And then last year, uh, I completed with the third fastest time on foot. So right behind Holberg. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> 
I'm, I'm a local. I live about an hour and a half from here. Gretchen, that was far too modest of an introduction for yourself. So, my name is Scott Holberg. Um, maybe my background, I kind of started running just to stay in shape through college. Uh, after college, I thought running a marathon was the craziest thing you could do. So, I got in shape and attempted that and kind of verified that, that was the craziest thing you could do. And eventually, I moved to Duluth maybe around 2008, 2009, and found out you could do a marathon on a trail. So, did the Eugene Kernow Marathon and thought that was the craziest thing ever. And then come to find out you can do that twice, two weeks later for a 50 mile race. So it just kind of kept going and going and longer and longer distances. But for the longest time, like this was the craziest thing, you know, being in Duluth, you hear stories about, you know, the Arrowhead 135, read blogs, race reports about the Arrowhead 135. I'm like, I don't know, that's, that's out there. People that want to do that are far, far too far out there. So. But after I did a couple hundreds, I'm like, maybe, maybe if I really put it together, I could give it a shot. So, I don't know, kind of the rest is history, I guess. I have done this eight times, eight time finisher. I think the only reason why Ken keeps letting me back in is he wants me to DNF it. So, I don't know, <laughs> this might be the year. So, we'll see how it goes. Awesome, okay. Uh, I'll ask a few questions. You don't all four have to answer, so feel free. Maybe if we get like two different perspectives or so, or if you really want to, we, we only have 55 or 50 minutes, unfortunately. So my first question for you is, why do you why do you keep coming back? What like maybe what's your motivation? What's your why? Like what compels you to return to this particular event? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely the community. You know, like that was the one really cool thing I remember from my very first time. When I was a rookie, even like the mayor of International Falls was here up on stage giving, you know, this speech about the, the streets of gold and, you know, and, you know, how he's there at the starting line and, you know, how there's just a bunch of really cool people associated with this race and it's like a kind of a homecoming every year and it's like, man, I really want to be a part of that and that's, that's kind of the thing that set the hook for me. And then the challenge of it too, like every year is so different. The weather makes it so different. The trail makes it so different. You know, the, the gear you select, the mode that you choose to do it in, it, you know, really makes a difference too. So, you know, even though you can crush it like Gretchen did last year, you know, like there's always some little tweaks of things you could do to really improve or to have different outcomes. So, you know, the fact that it's always changing is a big part for me. Yeah, just to piggyback on that quickly, because we have, I think it, I think Ken told me it's the largest rookie field in the race history with something like 60 or so. So I imagine um, a handful of you out there um, could be rookies, but Scott just said something really important, which is every year and every hour on the trail is different no matter how many times you've been here because of the temperature, the conditions, how you're feeling, maybe your gear choices. There are so many variables. Um, so. It can continue to be very interesting <laughs> year after year. So is Scott going to DNF this year? <laughs> Let's hope not. Let's hope not. <laughs> I would second that. Um, what Scott said, it's exactly what, what this race is about. Um, group of people, camaraderie, um, and, and every year it's different. And somehow always kicks my head. <laughs> and even after like doing it nine times, it, uh, it finds its way. <laughs> this is the ice box of the nation. Like it is colder here in International Falls than it was uh, on a majority of the 22 days that it uh, took Peter and I and our friend Casey to get to Nome in 2020. Uh, so it's it's cold. It's it beats us up. It is humbling. Um, and for me, I think that's one of my favorite things, too. Uh, Scott nailed it. The community is top notch. The ever changing conditions um, are just very challenging. And I like that challenge. Um, and I think Scott can finish this year. <laughs> okay, let's get into some maybe practical functional questions for a little bit because I think a lot of people want to know, you know, like, well, what are you eating? And what's your, you know, biggest tip for like best piece of gear? So, how about, um, let's see, I had a few questions here. Which one should we start with? All right. Top three gear like hacks or recommendations. Like, What are the three things that you're going to have on your sled, in your pack, or on your bike that are like, everybody should have this? 
Don't worry if you don't have it here, by the way. <laughs> I should, let me just, Ryan, I'm looking at Ryan out there because he, he, we had a chat this morning. He's like, make sure everybody knows that one size doesn't fit all. Um, just because I have something doesn't mean you have to have it, but I just think it's interesting what everybody carries, okay? Chapstick, uh, wool insoles, and um, I, I have a nose hat, which is like this felted, metally type thing. Uh, it kind of covers the bridge of your nose, your nose and your cheekbones, and it looks ridiculous when you wear it. Like you're not gonna look cool out there on the trail at negative degrees. Um, so this ridiculous thing covers my face and it protects it from frostbite. Um, and so making sure that you've got those good, uh, those good layers that are gonna protect the parts of your skin that you do have exposed, I think is, is just a really important thing to have. Um, I'm all for nose head, I have one too. <laughs> I would say um, take as many socks as you can to give some, always some dry socks on you. Uh, I, I'm going through this phase, like right before the race, every time. I have these crazy ideas, like the last minute, like the last night before I'm packing, coming up with these ideas. I guess I needed pressure, otherwise it's not, it's not coming in. So I came up with this uh, system how to fill my uh, bladder, which I carry underneath my jackets. And I'm going to share it with you. So it's a little pump, it's like a metal uh, I mean, rubber ball. So I can pump it straight from my uh, pot when it would be melting snow for water. So I don't have to take my jacket off. And then I'm going to just connect it to my uh, drinking tube. I'm going to just fill it right, right there without taking my jacket off. <laughs> nice. That's very smart. Rice Krispie bars, homemade Rice Krispie bars, and a, a lightweight jacket with a hood, and lots of lube for between your butt cheeks. <laughs> It's the same as chapstick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. It's a butt crack it, It's a thing, yeah. <coughs> Take care of that about gardens, I think, is the best place to do that. Right in the middle, right? Because you can get into a warm bathroom. Right so. in the middle. Right yeah. <laughs> in a lot of ways. But I think, I think Kate is, is spot on. Like, I think, you know, there's, there's really no one true thing that fits all. You know, I think really trying to get as much experience in advance trying to be really knowledgeable about what you have and why you have it with you and you know try not to you know pack all your fears you know that's one one thing i've heard you, you pack all your fears on your sled with you so you know try to be intentional about what you bring you know and, and have it be there for a reason not just well i need three of these in case the other two break you know maybe maybe not so i don't know i think one thing for me trekking poles you know those are really good they help you know, get good arm swing, you can kind of get momentum, get your good power height going if you're on foot. Chapstick, that's a solid one too. But, and keep it, you know, kind of close in so it stays, you know, relatively, uh, relatively warm. And I always put it on the bridge of my nose and I put it on my eyelids and, you know, kind of all around my eyes. So, like, that's a really important thing. That's the one thing you really can't cover up. So, and I don't know what else. Um, yeah, loops probably good. Man, I'm running over. It's not going. It's not good going last. I'll say that. I have something funky. Well, it's not funky, but something that it's like a superstition with me. I bring an extra headlamp because I've borrowed one from somebody before, and I also in um, on the Iditarod around mile 100 lost my GPS tracker in the deep snow, and so if you lose your headlamp, um, good luck. <laughs> so I'm just like one of you is going to need mine tomorrow, so I have it, <laughs> um, and I will pay it forward one day, but yeah. Cool. Um, so this, you know, every few years we have a really cold year. I would say this is probably going to be one of those colder years. I mean, um, whatever you can find on the uh, weather for tomorrow or the next three days, you can probably bet it's going to be 10 to 15 degrees colder in the swamps than you can find on any kind of weather report, so just prepare for that. 
So my question for this group is, how might you approach this really cold year? Like, what's something that you might do differently in terms of gear or strategy or whatever it is? You can you can give a nugget that you might prepare for differently in a in a colder year than like a kind of cold year or warm, which would be like 15 degrees, right? Yeah. I think yeah, I think you hit it spot on to begin with. That every year you hear a race report of someone like, oh, well, it's 10 degrees colder than the forecast. That's like, well, you know, you wouldn't guarantee forecasts any other day of the week. So, you know, why are you thinking it is the same? And it's going to be cold in the swamps, exactly. So, you know, the one thing I do is I will always pack one extra layer than what I think I will need. So, you know, this year I'm definitely going to have a puppy jacket and I'll have maybe puppy pants. Yeah, I'm almost possible to bring those with. But, you know, you should have a layer that you don't think you'll use because those are kind of like your, your oh shit layer, you know, in case you can't move as fast as you can or you can't get calories down and you start getting cold. You have that layer that you weren't planning to wear that you can put on to get you to the next checkpoint. So you don't have to be necessarily when you're starting to get cold. Mine is to have a really big gloves because, and then always thinking ahead. So if I know I have to stop and take things out of my pack, um, prior to doing that, I've already either gotten my big gloves out so I can slip my hands right back in there, or gotten hand warmers out and they're already warm. And then keeping in mind that we're out, with Arrowhead, we're always training for it to be 30 below. Like, it's going to be 30 below, and if it's not, we're all going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, in general, when, when you know, you're expecting really cold weather, make everything as simple as possible. Like, all your systems on your bikes or skis or whatever, make it streamlined, make it so it's easy to open, close, cinch, so you don't have to, you know, work from, you know, every minute counts when it's really cold you have to take your gloves, your big gloves off and you don't have much time. So try to make it as simple as possible so you can, uh, you can dine, you know, you can dine fast, whatever you need to do and provide advice. Mm -hmm. I think um, letting go of expectations is a really good way to go about a cold year like this. Um, don't go out there thinking you're gonna set any course records, uh, you're gonna make top top three, top 10, uh, you're gonna beat your buddy. It's really hard when you go into something like this with that mindset because you can very easily put yourself in a hole by getting too sweaty and not being able to uh, regular t uh, regulate temperature. You might forget to hydrate or eat. And then by the time you realize like, oh shoot, I'm dehydrated or, um, I should probably eat, you might be in a hole and it's gonna be a lot harder to crawl out of that hole than it is to just kind of stay on top of things. Um, so for me personally, uh, being able to monitor myself, check in with myself, make sure I'm taking care of myself, like I'll, I'll get to tower when I get there, um, hopefully a little bit faster in time to like hang out with everybody, but um, just throwing out the expectations of finishing at any specific time to keep myself from getting negative, um, I think it's, it's an important thing for me personally, at least. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, sweat management and then also taking care of, like, taking care of, you all kind of touch on it a little bit, but anticipating your needs and taking care of it right away. So if your toes start to feel cold, they're just going to get colder. There's a high chance where if your fingers start to get cold, just look at it and address it because really sucks if you get frostbite and have to go to the hospital. Some cook, you know, it's close by, but come on. Um, it'll, it's, it might happen, but Ken will give his whole speech here. And, um, but just take care of yourselves. Um, let's talk about biggest lessons learned or the mistake that you made. And um, yes, let's, let's hear it. What was something that happened to you and you thought, wow, that, that was a pretty, pretty big lesson? <laughs> In my first arrowhead, I realized I had two left gloves. And uh, again, when um, on the Arrowhead <laughs> Trail, I also noticed that I had two of the same handed gloves. <laughs> so that's like a really very basic uh, mistake that I've made, but check, check to make sure that you've got uh, 
two socks, the left and right hand glove, and, and uh, just kind of make sure that you've got what you think you've got on your bike. I think my biggest mistake was not eating right one, one year, and I did myself pretty good haul, and I barely made it out of uh, the ski pole in the last checkpoint. Um, fortunately, I was still able to get hydrated and eat, and I was able to finish, but it was pretty tough, so deal with, with you know, all you know, your needs and your um, hydration and food in time, so it's not too late. Yeah, mine kind of goes wrong with that too. Um, they say like if you thought I should get some food out of my pockets or out of my sled, and then but you don't, and then you, a second, a little while later, you're thinking the same thought. And the chances that once you've done that, you know, an hour can go by and you thought that thought like a hundred times. So I think that's just you know, the initial phase is realizing that. Um, in a big release, I can't just go fast to get to the finish. I have to stop, stop and walk back to that stupid sled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, let's see, I think one of the things I've struggled with is, you know, using the chemical heaters, like Gretchen mentioned, in your gloves. You know, you need to be thinking about those because they do tend to swap your hands out a little bit. So you need to get you know, as one's dying, you need to get the next one started. So I've I've had that where you know you have in your sled they're frozen and you try try get them going and they don't do anything for like a half hour or hour before you start getting any heat and you've got that ice cold pack of you know, chemical heater in your mitten for the longest time. So you know, try get that you know next to your body or something like that where you can start getting getting it warmed up or you know warming food up before you put it in your mouth. So you're not crack and tease while you're trying to chew on a sticker bar or something like that. So, yeah, just kind of plan ahead, you know, and be monitoring yourself. You know, take the music out and maybe, you know, think about how you're feeling and kind of go through the check mental checklist of, you know, are you dry? Are you sweating? You know, have, when was the last time you ate? Things like that. So just, just be very mindful and in the moment. Is that your biggest mistake? We don't have enough time for all my mistakes. <laughs> if, if you want to hear a story, go to 10 Junk Miles podcast, long run number 71. It's four hours, and you can hear Scott talk about um, the idea to run finish, and it's worth it. So just go look it up. Yeah. No, it wasn't, it wasn't quite that bad. It was pretty close. Yeah. I, I was concerned about being in front of snow people, so I discreetly turned away. That's another day, so we don't have time for that. Yeah, there's Plus, so there's many two mistakes. I'm going to ask for some stories in a minute. I just have a couple more things that, to cover the grounds, but we don't have time for you. <laughs> um, so I think in um, any ultra sport, summer, winter, any mode of transportation, um, people would say that the hardest thing is really your mental game. It's, it's not the fitness, you can train for that. It's hard for everybody after a certain point, but um, people often forget to train their mind. And you know, it's going to be cold this week, this week um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, uh, it, and that's gonna be really hard, but I might argue that's not gonna be the hardest challenge that we will face out there. So I'd like to know from you all, like where, where do you go to pull yourself out of dark places? What is your mantra? How do you stay positive and stay the course what have you learned what's a what's a good um some advice for you that works for you to share with this group <laughs> that's a tough one i feel like it's different every time but one of the things i go back to is you know how how lucky how lucky i am to be doing things like this you know that you know there's a lot of people and you know Every year it's mentioned, you know, during, during the meeting, you know, the people that have died, you know, from other causes, not related to this race, but, you know, that don't have a chance to do this anymore. So that's one thing that means a lot to me, you know, just having the ability to be out here. You know, thinking about the support my family gives me that allows me to be out here and have that time away from me. You know, that's important for me to, to give my all and to, you know, kind of use this time you know, to the best of my ability. You know, there's no, there's no shame in dropping out or not being able to finish, but, you know, giving your all because, you know, it's, it's, it's worth your time to do that. Oh, 
how do we keep our mental strength? Is or just, you, yeah. Um, when I started out running, um, it, I'm a type 1 diabetic and my daughter was also diagnosed. So my mantra, it was kind of easy because I had a reason. So, um, and then once I accomplished learning how to run with type 1 diabetes, I had to recreate a reason of, as to why I was out there doing it. So I think it's a lot easier to to mentally kind of fold out there if the reason we're out there isn't one that we really believe in. That's a deep thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's really. It's it, no matter how how prepared are you, even mentally, it's still pretty hard. There are some situations that you can tell yourself that we'll watch you how, how lucky you are doing it and all the support and stuff, but it doesn't get any easier. It helps, but um, sometimes you just have to reset things like logically for, for a minute, calm down, and methodically, you know, um, pull yourself out, kind of, you know, start doing the stuff you have to do, and just focus on it. Don't panic. It's easy to say, but uh, that's the only way that it works, really. You just keep calm and just um, deal with the most important things. Stay warm, the hydrated, fat, and then go from there. Like, methodically, you know, but just do steps to prevent more injuries or um, getting into more trouble. I guess just focus on what you're doing, think about it, stop, and uh, yeah, prevent more damage, I guess. I have a bell on my bike, and when I start to get sad, I ding it. <laughs> 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 but um, the hamburger? No, well, not on this bike. Oh. I had the hamburger bell in there. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so I mean, I try to make it as lighthearted as possible because we are so fortunate to be able to acquire all this ridiculous gear, all the expensive components, the parts gathering all that stuff, spending years gathering all of that stuff. Um, it, we're just really lucky to be out there and to be able to do this. So I try to remind myself I paid for this. Like, <laughs> no one's forcing me to be out here. Um, but I also, on a lot of my training rides, I, um, I get into some pretty wacky shenanigans with some friends. And so, like, we'll be out riding and in a specific condition will pop up and it will remind me of a ride that I was on with some buddies and we were laughing. So like, even if it is harder, even if it's more difficult by being colder or I'm cold, I'm hungry, like I'm cranky, I just try to remember and focus on those bright shiny spots. Um, the bell kind of quickly will get me out of it sometimes. Um, I try to make lists of all the reasons why I'm so excited to be out there, all the friends that uh, aren't able to do something like this, so it, it kind of gives me a little bit of power to continue through. Um, and I also don't let myself say negative things out loud, um, because if you hear it, you're going to start believing it. So I try to trick myself by saying, like, I love going uphill. I love pushing my bike. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of trying to trick your brain in, trying to be cheery when things suck, um, and laughing about other silly times that you've had. Well, you, can, you can try, uh, you can, if you're lucky enough, you can find Trail Buddy, like yeah. Jill, and they, they, that's basically <laughs> takes care of it. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's a huge way to stay, like, keep yourself um, positive, is to feed off somebody else or have a buddy out there. If, if this is your first Arrowhead or your first Winter Ultra of this distance, you might find yourself 
with somebody else that you've never met before, but you might spend a day or three days on the trail together. Um, I would just caution if you're around anyone who's really negative and saying negative things, um, we're in a dark place. If you can't pull them out of it, like get away from them. <laughs> Sorry, but you're gonna bring us all down. <laughs> um, so I try to stay away from the negative Nellies on the trail and just go by myself if it's not happening. But you know, you might wanna be a good friend, trail friend and try to lift them up first. If it's not working, then you go do your own race. So. Sometimes it works though, like if it's raining and you're pushing through the snow and you say, this is really fun. Peter will say, this is how people get hypothermic and die. <laughs> and then you just kind of laugh and keep going. <laughs> okay, so I have another question for you all. Have you experienced any growth from these adventures or from Arrowhead in particular that you have then brought back to the rest of your life and your world, personal growth? The big things at work that used to frustrate me um, or things in life that used to bother me don't seem so big anymore after you're able to do something like this. Um, yeah, definitely. We, we get mental strength kind of trained on those races and um, it helps in everyday life. I mean, you don't get frustrated. You get frustrated, but you get, get over it easier than, I guess, for that. I think, I mean, like, so like that's totally true, and you guys would totally think that. Like, and I totally agree with it. <laughs> but like sometimes I think um, through life and like all of like, I mean, every single person has a story. And so, and being out on the trail, sometimes I think about, and what I've walked away with is, I would kind of like to be alone in the cold, on the trail, than doing a lot of the other things that real life does have to bring. Um, and I think that that's, I think the trail has helped me through some of those really, those hard things. And then as we go into Arrowhead or those other crazy winter things, keep your clothes on. When you go into those, I think sometimes the fact that you're even towing that line is because life has made you mentally strong to bring you even to that point. So for the record, there's no clothes getting taken off. <laughs> it was a hydration bladder that was taken off after it was empty and then it was laid on the trail because you don't need hydration after you finish a race that you haven't finished. So no undressing, no undressing happened. But yeah, I think, you know, that's, you do have a lot of takeaways, you know, that you're, you know, stronger than you thought, you know, that you can persevere and, you know, you can you have all the tools to fix your problems. You know, there's. There's a, a lot of, you know, really kind of high level things, you know, and, you know, working through the low spots, you know, that you're really going to have terrible, terrible patches and that's honestly okay. And, you know, maybe you can't pull yourself out of it as quickly as you, as you would like. And, you know, it's not all, you know, rose petals and berries, you know, sometimes it's, it's real dark moments for a very long period of time, but the sun's going to come up in the morning and it's going to be great and your energy level is going to come up again. So, you know, you, you can be okay with being unokay and, you know, it'll, it's not going to stay bad forever, basically. It's one of the things I guess I've found out too. And, you know, and not succeeding is, is really enlightening as well. Like, man, I got really mad about not finishing ITI, being so close to the finish line, but I realized how much more I can push and how deep the well actually goes when you're, you know, put up against that. So, you know, after that, I honestly came back and had a really good arrowhead in a polar vortex and it wasn't that big a deal anymore. So, you know, learning opportunities through failure, you know, that, those are, those are powerful moments too, so. Yeah, don't make any decisions unless until you've had a warm meal or you're warm just get to that next checkpoint and then assess if you want to drop <laughs> because you will push through that next wall but sometimes it just takes a moment of rest um so uh last question before i want to get to audience questions here which is best thing you've hallucinated 
It's going to happen. Many of us report parking lots or teepees or buildings out in the forest. Um, all the trees and the snow turn into people and cars and other things. Um, I've seen little gnomes peeking at me behind trees. Um, I even thought my breath was ghosts and started swatting at it and screaming. Um, so let's hear it. I'll say maybe one of the most other vivid memories I've had is at Tuscovia and I was trying to get to the finish line and I was just pushing as hard as I could towards the finish line and Tuscovia is just, you know, it's a rail to trail. It's just flat, it's flat forever. And I was in this power hike where the, the pace wasn't what I wanted it to be and I just wanted everything to be over with and I was just powering as hard as I could straight forward. And, I was hallucinating like crossing guards from like railroad crossings and like furniture, like sofas and like everything just in front of me, like all these barricades just trying to slow me down. And I just, <laughs> just completely oblivious to it. You just see it and you just motor, you know, just in the you know, fastest power hike I could go, just straight through it, just ignoring it completely I and mean, just being mad about the whole situation and just gotta get that I'm all, in my mind like there's all these barriers just physical mental all of it it's just materializing as you know actual you know barriers for things so i don't know that was that was one really insightful thing like why do you see the things you do when you see them and i don't know that was kind of you know more straightforward and literal i guess so that was interesting um vivian i had a friend in my bivy sack, a girl named Jen, and I was really concerned about her nose freezing. <laughs> and then another time on the, the trail, and I'm not sure if this was partly me hallucinating or if the other guy was just super hallucinating, but we were both on opposite sides of the trail, and then eventually he came slowly over to my side and was like, you know, right next to me, and he was talking about how he had, you know, this was a finishing time of nearly 50 hours and he hadn't slept yet. And I had slept like a couple times. And he was talking about how he found these amazing mushrooms that gave him <laughs> tons of energy and, and then these caffeinated leaves and all this stuff. <laughs> I have two good ones. Um, the one, first one was back in 2018 when I did uh, JP's Fat Pursuit. I was not sleeping for probably 20 hours. And um, like in the middle of no woods, like right outside of Yellowstone Park in, in, in the woods, I thought I saw a gas station like right on the trail. I, mean, I, was, I, I sped up. I was like, yeah, I'm going to get them a cup of coffee and uh, something sweet. And then, fortunately, I, I actually fell asleep and I ended up in a ditch that, that, that kind of woke me up. And uh, the second, uh, the other one, the other time was last year. Um, I, was, I was out on the trail by myself most of the time. So some six, 15, 16 days, I was mostly alone. And, all kinds of weird stuff happening when you're just by yourself. First of all, it's really hard uh, to deal with uh, the hardship. I learned that way. I learned the hard way that, that I learned that last year because I mean, the prior, in those prior years, I'd been riding with someone, or we had a little, uh, had a little, you know, a group with Jill and Casey. But last year was. First time I've spent most of the time, like two days ahead of everybody else, alone. So I've, I've last, so the, the last night on the trail for finish, I was going up those like last big hills before Nome. It's called Topcock Hills. They're not super steep, but they're like they're. They're pretty, pretty, they suck. They suck. <laughs> you go up and down, up and up. Those are really long, like, they're not super rugged, but it's really long slog up, you have to push. And I haven't seen anybody for like days. And all of a sudden, um, I'm riding my bike and it was getting really bad. The wind was picking up and it was cold. And I was like, 
completely covered with the hood and my roof and but everything I uh, everything I had I put I put it on top of myself. And um, all of a sudden I can hear like so um I so I thought it's a it's a mushing team, like a slab dog team right behind me, like telling me like, hey, get out of the way. And it was just keep so I got so disoriented, I fell off my bike, and I was like running around in circles, looking and shining my light <laughs> in every direction to find out it was like, it was actually the, 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 the sound was created in my head, like while I was you know, breathing really hard, it was like clicking, something was clicking <laughs> in my ear or something. So I calmed myself down, myself down. And, Realized that there's not, not nobody behind me, and nobody like within like 30 miles around me. <laughs> I'm really glad that some fresh people have come in to hear my R-rated story. <laughs> uh, so the the first trail halluc hallucinations I've ever had, uh, I'm, bl I'm blushing. Uh, they were so vivid. <laughs> That uh, later on at, at Pursuit up on Tuta, I thought I saw some like snow Tyrannosaurus rexes in the trees. And so I stopped to actually take pictures because my first hallucinations were so vivid that I was like, there's no way snow could look like that. Uh, and then when I looked at the pictures later, I was like, yeah, yeah I definitely had some crazy hallucinations. So uh, my R rated hallucinations in my first arrowhead. Um, my husband, Dan, was like out kind of cheering me on along the way. And there were a couple spots where he was drawing like little stars and like the Super Mario kind of like uh, the outlines of like the mushroom and stuff like in the trail. So there were a couple times when I would ride across the trail and be like, oh, Dan was here. And then after Mel George, on my way to uh, Ski Folk, I started seeing some like really huge snow vaginas. <laughs> very elaborate, <laughs> tall, as tall as me on the side of the trail, like not one, several. <laughs> and I thought he had just like made them on the side of the trail. And I was like, how much time did it take for him to do this? <laughs> and like I saw someone on later on down the trail and I was like, did you see those snow vaginas? <laughs> It was, I don't know, Scott's talking about like some inner workings. I don't know what I was thinking about, <laughs> what I did at that time. Who needs television? We need to just go hallucinate. Do we have a psychologist? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we have, let's see, we have about nine minutes, ten minutes. So I'm going to walk around. Questions from the audience. Yes. I come from the part of the country where uh, it doesn't get cold much. So how do you guys deal with water? I, I mean, Jill and I talk about it a lot, but I still don't have a solution. I went for a two-mile ride this morning and my pack froze. How do you guys deal with it? It's um, definitely slower for me. I've done, I've done the way um, of having the hydration pack on my back, uh, underneath layers, running the hose underneath my armpit blowing the water back in. Um, so I've done it that way before, but I am also very clumsy, if you guys couldn't get that from me already. Um, so like, I've had my, my bladder explode before, I've had the, the hose freeze, it hurts my back sometimes. Um, so I go the old-fashioned way now of having insulated thermoses that fit inside of like uh, protected areas on my bike. I'll take uh, toe warmers or body warmers and start them up and put them in like my frame bag or in my fork bag. Um, and it, it definitely takes longer to get to your water that way, but I know that it's not gonna freeze. And she also have mushers bring her services on the trail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she also has her mushers running behind us, pounding, growing. Nicholas <laughs> what a nice guy. Um, I, I'm a big believer in just keeping the water in my body to keep it warm uh, so I don't have to worry about how long, how much time I have for my insulated bottles 
uh, get frozen. So I just keep um, a bladder on my, like, on, on top of my base layer with all the jackies on top of it. And I'm pretty fortunate that I can have a, a lot of froze up, I guess. But I also, um, I also carry a little thermos bottle, usually with coffee or something warm. So it's, I guess it's kind of like a backup. But most of my hydration is in the bladder directly on my body. And just make sure for anyone, if this is your first cold experience, um, blow back your water from your valve. So take a sip and then blow it back so all the water goes back into the bladder. And then, because it's, you know, there's not, there's tons of surface area on your tube. So that's how it freezes. And I've forgotten to do that so many times. So we'll move to the next question. Great. If you have one with the heater. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question. And, and keep your clothes, maybe underneath, not over your shoulder. That's most likely it's going to freeze on the top of your shoulder. So I keep mine like down here and coming up through the middle. Yep. You can also mix your hydration pack 50% vodka, 50%. <laughs> okay, we had a question about pithying in the woods. Um, just maybe some tips or pointers. Is that? Like, is that was that your question? Yes. Yeah. How to sleep in the woods? Maybe just a couple, yeah. a couple tips. Do you change stuff? Oh, I'm holding. <laughs> change socks if they get wet. Definitely. Um, I'm a poor one to ask about bathing. I try not to do it, but I've gotten burned on that one. So I'll let the thousand mile talk about bathing. You have to. <laughs> so. If it's not snowing, or blowing snow, you'd be better off just putting your insulated pad on top of the snow and put sleeping bag on top of it and just don't put anything over, like a baby or you know, even tent. I think it's better because no matter what you do, inside of the baby, it's always gonna get, get uh, uh, wet condensation so if it's snowing then you kind of have to cover your sleeping bag if it's not some sleeping bags are waterproof made of waterproof membrane material uh, yeah so I like to stump down the snow um, a little bit wider than my sleeping pad. Um, I carry a sheet of Tyvek now too, and that's really nice to have just kind of like a waterproof layer that you can lay down before you put your insulated pad down, before you put your sleeping bag on top of it, or before you crawl into your bivy. Like that little piece of Tyvek is kind of a nice little uh, barrier for you. Um, and I, I completely agree with Peter on. Um, if it's not raining out, if there's no uh, like snow or rain or uh, like acclimation out there, um, I'll forego the bivy and crawl just into my sleeping bag because that way your body heat can dry all the stuff that you've got inside of it, um, which is nice. Uh, if you want to get really fancy, you can get some spruce boughs and put them down underneath <laughs> your tie back and your sleeping bed and everything, but it, it all just comes down to how much time are you going to nap. Um, like I've just laid down and slept for an hour before, and for that it's just a sleeping pad, sleeping bag, take a quick little power nap, and then get back on the bike and go. Um, but I also really enjoy like long eight hour naps. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Oh, I will add quickly too, um, I also keep a candy bar in my sleeping bag. Uh, so if you do start to get cold as you're laying down to go to bed, eat some calories and then uh, you'll be warmer. Just a follow up for the bivy question. Do you take off your outer shells? Do you go in just as you are? You know, I've uh, bivied a few times and tend to overheat and then getting back out and on the trail is really difficult. So how many layers do you take off or do you keep it all on to try to dry it and bivy with you? I've made the mistake of taking my boots off before when bivying, and then when I wake up, 
my boots are frozen and I can't get my foot back in, and that sucks. <laughs> um, but it just depends on the weather, truthfully. If it is, uh, like, if I'm super exhausted, uh, it's really, really cold, and we just need to stop and sleep, I'll just crawl in wearing everything. Um, if you've got, like, a nice little fire or something going, uh, you can change layers if you want. Um, but I, I tend to kind of listen to what my body needs, and I'll put on some dry stuff or take some stuff off and kind of wad it up in my sleeping bag. Um, but mostly, uh, I think especially for like a race scenario, I just kind of crawl in and get everything. Yeah, same here. Um, it always depends on how you feel, what temperatures are, how, how wet you got, you know, sweaty. Sometimes it's just very uncomfortable and there's really nothing you can do about it, so you just have to get comfortable to be uncomfortable, I guess. Put um, hand warmers inside your sleeping bag before, so they're in there if you have to bivvy. And then before you bivvy, do, do sit-ups so you get your body temperature warm before you get out. And then this is how you really do it. On your sled, you take a million 10 minute naps. You just curl up on your sled and then you get up and you start running. <laughs> Shake away. But off, off the trail, Gretchen. Right. Off the trail. <laughs> Everything off the trail. <laughs> but yes, the shiver bivy, I think, does, does wonder. It's just laying down on your sled, taking your, the weight off your feet and just sort of relaxing your body. That, that really helps. Too, so. Micro I think it's called. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. All these questions are making me think of what Right, oh. right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're waiting, waiting. Okay. Come on, let's get some more questions. I think no, you told me that you got to be prepared for it. I think that's the way it's to improvise. Yeah. Be, be good at it. Yeah. Um, for those who have DNF'd, what do you think is the difference between the years that you finished and the years that you didn't finish? I know exactly what I was. Try to go up to the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, team. <laughs> Uh, so the, the first year I did Arrowhead, I went into it all curi like curious, red-eyed, bushy-tailed. Uh, I was prepared for any scenario, I didn't have expectations, and I had a really good time. Uh, my second year at Arrowhead, uh, same thing, I went into it cautious, very humbled, uh, wanting to, to you know learn from the trail, and I had a great time, and I set the women's course record, which was great. And then I went back for my third arrowhead and I wanted to do it unsupported and I went out as though I was doing it supported. Uh, I tried to stay with um, some of the first people that were kind of in this pace line and I got very sweaty and just got myself into a hole and then I, like, I allowed myself to say negative things. And um, by the time I made it to Mel George, I had already talked myself into being done. Um, and then the second time I tried unsupported, uh, I tried not to have any expectations, uh, but I still, like, in the back of my head, I was like, you know what, I've done this in, like, 16 hours and 40 minutes before. I can do this. And um, I just, same thing, went out too hard, got too sweaty, started being negative, started um, voicing out loud that I wasn't having a good time. Um, and again, same thing, by the time I made it to Mel George, I. I was just done. Um, and also, like, if you're unsupported, you're not allowed to go inside of Mel George's, but, like, you can kind of peer inside, and you see people, like, eating snacks, <laughs> and, like, all warm and cozy, and I, I saw my friend in there, and I was just kind of like, I want to be in there with them. And uh, so I, I think um, the reason why I DNF those years is because I went out too fast. Like, I let myself get sweaty, I let myself get into a hole, uh, I, you know, I heard that voice in my head saying I should probably eat right now, or I should probably drink, or I should probably melt snow, and I just ignored that voice and, and said, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it when I get to Mel George, or I'll do it further down the trail. And I didn't take care of myself, I didn't listen to my body, and I paid for it. Like, luckily, I've 
knock on wood, I've never had frostbite. <laughs> now watch me get it <clears throat> tomorrow, hopefully not. Um, but uh, I just, you know, I, I pulled myself before I went too deep into that hole, uh, but I, I should have listened to myself. I should have slowed it down a little bit. Okay. Okay. That's all the time that we have. Um, thank it's such you. a bummer to leave it. Can we leave it on a positive thing? Yeah. It's really fast. Yeah. Which Who's got the most positive thing to say? Um, Is it a DNS? You. Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be positive out there, everybody. Let's get that finish rate up. Just kidding. Let's people go. Keep be negative, right, Ken? <laughs> okay. But thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, the four of you coming. I know it's kind of stressful and hard the night before race to to come and spend this time for an hour. Thank all of you for coming. And at four o'clock on the dot, Ken's gonna start the racers meeting. So um, good luck out there, be safe, be happy, you know, help friends on the trail, just be a good steward of this race.